Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Conference of World Affairs. My name is Ben Teitelbaum. I'm an assistant professor of ethnomusicology and international affairs here on campus. It is a pleasure uh, to welcome you to this event this morning. Uh, our topic for this panel, populism and the alt-right around the world. You could think, and there are those who, who might argue, that this is one topic among many. I am not one of those people. I believe that this issue, what we are discussing this morning, is the political issue. It has transformed politics throughout the West and beyond in ways we are still grappling with. I'm also 100% convinced that what we are discussing in this panel is something we do not yet fully understand. Uh, uh, an approach of open inquiry, uh, of curiosity and a willingness to talk, ask questions, I think is exactly what is needed. And I'm so happy to see such a large audience at this early hour. Uh, the, the topic is, is one that is uh, going to be discussed at a number of panels uh, throughout, this, uh, throughout this conference, but it is still, I think, uh, worthwhile dwelling on it here. Our speakers, uh, our, our presenters in this panel, can bring a diversity of perspectives on this topic as well. First, to my left, we have uh, Jennifer Fitzgerald, Associate Professor of Political Science here on campus, a very well-known and uh, popular professor uh, with students as, uh, as I th think many of them would attest. It's also worth noting that she's not only a specialist uh, in comparative politi political behavior, but she just published a book Close to Home, Local Ties and Voting Radical Right in Europe on this very topic. It's published through Cambridge University Press. It is, uh, of course, uh, a pleasure to have her with us. To her left, uh, Bob Dreyfus. Uh, now, I think, can we say a veteran of the Conference of World Affairs? Fair. Fair enough. Uh, he is a journalist. You could see his work appearing in so many different venues, including uh, Rolling Stone, Mother Jones, American Prospect. You might see him on TV, PBS, uh, Sean Hannity even, as well as NBC's Morning Joe. Um, and you can read about him as uh, also a, a famous uh, and eager traveler. Uh, to his left, uh, we welcome Maggie Mitchell-Salem to the Conference of World Affairs. She's executive director at the Qatar Foundation International. Uh, she has been involved in a wide range of initiatives uh, focusing on the Middle East uh, and North Africa in many instances. Uh, she also was special assistant to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, uh, in addition to other diplomatic uh, engagements. We are very excited to have her. A few words about procedure. Uh, those of you who have the CWA app are more than welcome to submit questions to me via that app. I will receive them on my laptop here and we will work them into our Q&A. Otherwise, I would like to ask our producers to please stand and identify themselves in the room. We should have three producers, two in the back. Bob is up here in the front. Uh, they are available for question cards as well. They can collect your questions throughout this session. Uh, we will begin with opening statements and a conversation amongst our panelists. Uh, and then we will turn to you uh, and, and invite you into our conversation this morning. Make sense? All right. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome our first panelist, uh, Jennifer Fitzgerald, with her opening statement. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, thank you for the nice introduction, and I'm so thrilled to be on such an illustrious panel. Um, I hope you guys have fun today and, and learn a bunch. I'm sure we will. Um, well, as we sit up here. So I thought just in my opening statements, I'd give um, the audience a little sense of what kind of work I do that relates to this topic and um, just give you a few nuggets of things that I've, I've learned through my research over the last several years. Um, I, I study political behavior, which just means regular people and the way they relate to politics. And I focus mostly on Europe. So European political behavior is, is really sort of my main area of focus. And that relates to political psychology, that relates to sort of the, the ways that people make their choices about political parties. So I come from a sort of broad angle, but I've been attracted to this topic for probably the same reasons you guys are here. It's just fascinating and important. As Ben said, it's probably the issue of our time. The kinds of parties that I've been focusing on lately are called right-wing populist or radical right populist. And I thought I'd just maybe get a definition out so we all know um, at least where I'm coming from in terms of the specific concepts involved. So um, right-wing populist parties tend to be 
as you know, I'm sure, anti-immigrant, sort of anti-globalization, and, and there's a very strong piece of this that is also sort of anti-modernity. It, it's sort of a nostalgia kind of party that is very backward looking. And the reason I think that's important is because a lot of center right parties, you know, conventional right parties, also have some t tougher rhetoric and policies on things like immigration or the European Union. And what really differentiates radical right parties is not so much extremism as much as this image of offering a past time, offering a past <coughs> moment that may or may not be real, right? It could just be imagined and romanticized. But the idea is that there's something that we have moved away from in terms of our experience as societies that we should go back to. And going back is oftentimes put in some pretty gruesome terms, becoming less diverse, for instance. And there's sort of an anti-multicultural component to this. So those are the kinds of parties that I tend to study, and in particular, I study their voters. So a few little things that I've found over the years that I think are interesting that might be fun to talk about today. As Ben mentioned, um, I, I wrote a book on this. I went to rural France and hung out in wine country. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> really, I should have gotten hazard pay. Um, and, and I tried to figure out something that was really interesting to me, which was there are areas of France that are just rural and beautiful and verdant and just absolutely, like, it's a, the place you want to be. When you close your eyes, it's a place I just want to imagine I am a lot of the time. And it seems like a place where everyone should be really happy and doing well and thriving and, and really quite moderate politically, given that things are going pretty well. And instead, people are mad. People are ticked off. And they're voting for some, some really quite radical poli policy prescriptions, some, some pretty radical parties like the National Front. I'm sure you know about this one. Um, and so I went there to try to figure out what was going on. And, and the short answer, you know, the long answer is a book. Um, <laughs> the short answer it has to do with status and the way that people feel about themselves and the way that they derive self-esteem from the groups that they belong to. And it's a really, it was a very powerful experience. It was a really interesting um, sort of set of messages I got from just talking with people, not necessarily supporters of the radical right so much as just talking to people there to find out what life was like. I learned a great deal and then I, you know, destroyed it all with statistics and, you know, beat the reader over the head with tables. But, but at the heart of it, there's, there's a really sort of human story here that I, th I think um, should be told. So that's, that's something that I'd be happy to talk about further. Um, something else that I think is kind of interesting, I tried to figure out how networks within the family, um, moms, dads, kids, and the kinds of conversations people have at home might affect the extent to which people decide to support these parties. And this sort of, I don't know, this is a paper I wrote a few years ago, but this, this, this finding that I had actually tells a story through which young people, and by this I mean, you know, late 20s, or um, early 20s, tend to influence their parents when it comes to these parties. That when they talk to their parents, they're injecting these new ideas. And it's sort of a twist on your typical socialization story that you've probably heard before through which parents influence their children when it comes to politics, right? That's how you learn who to vote for. Your parents give you all those signals. And there's this interesting sort of disruption going on within families that we can see where young people are bringing new ideas and sort of, sort of wild electoral ideas into the family and actually influencing their parents. And I think that's pretty, pretty interesting too. So I've got some human stories to tell about um, the radical right, about right-wing populism, and I look forward to your questions and talking to my fellow panelists. Thank you. Bob? Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to see everybody out so bright and cheerful to talk about a panel about neo-Nazis, so. <laughs> um, but we'll spoil your day right away, and you can go home and drink or something, I don't know. Um, so, so he mentioned that I was on the Sean Hannity show. I have to say, by the way, I mean, he used to call me up and have me on um, as, like, as a punching bag, right? Although I'm very good at like ducking and stuff. Um, but I have to tell you about the time he tried to kill Sean Hannity, which I have to make a confession about. So he had me on to talk. This is during one of the Israeli invasions, so many to count, 
of Lebanon. Um, there had been like a border incident. I think two Israelis had been kidnapped or killed or something near the Lebanon border. So the Israelis decided in their understated way to invade the whole country and bomb Beirut and occupy the airport and do all these things, kill thousands of people in Lebanon over this incident. So I went on the Sean Hannity show to talk about it. And I mentioned that this was an overreaction by the Israelis. And Hannity went, Overreaction, overreaction, if I hear that word one more time, I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> so with perfect Jack Benny timing, beat, and I said, overreaction. <laughs> so even my brother, who's a Rush Limbaugh person, said he fell off the couch laughing. So. <laughs> But Sean is still alive and, as you know, campaigning for the president. So, um, so look, this is really scary stuff, I think. Um, it, you know, when Trump was campaigning, um, me and many, many other people started thinking, like, are we, like, in the 1930s again? Like, this re could this really be happening, right? And, and I wanted to start out by two quotes to start with, um, and I'll get to the part about populism in a second. But um, so. Back in 2016, does anybody remember when Trump said about Hillary Clinton, I'm gonna read you the quote, I looked it up this morning to make sure I got it exactly right. Um, if she gets, to, I can't do the imitation of Trump, but this was not a tweet, this was like a, a blabbing. If she gets to pick her judges, nothing you can do, folks. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe them, I don't know. Now, the Second Amendment people we know are the gun nuts. So he's, this is a direct threat to kill her. I mean, who does that as a presidential candidate, right? Then just, I think, two weeks ago, there's another quote from him. Um, he said, and I'm reading this again, the exact words, so I, I looked it up this morning to get it exactly right. I can tell you I have the support of the police. I have the support of the military. I have the support of bikers for Trump. <laughs> but they don't play it tough until they go too far. And then it would be very bad, very bad. OK, so this is a president now of the United States threatening to mobilize literally fascist forces, not that the police and the military are fascist, but he means you know, his gangsters, in, in a violent effort to put down the, the left, with the social, big threat from socialism that we're facing, right? So you start to wonder, like, what are the differences now in, between, like, say, Germany in the 20s and America in this period? And I read a book about this, I'm sure some of you have done, and there's a whole bunch of parallels, but one of the things that Trump didn't have, that Hitler had in the, the late 20s, was the the SA, I can't pronounce it in German, but everybody knows what that, the Sturm, Abd, whatever, okay. He had, he had the, the, the fascist thugs who were, a, a, you know, a violent armed street mob that attacked communists and labor rallies and, and Jew, all, all the things that they were against, right? And beat them up and, and really helped bring Hitler to power by eliminating, crushing the opposition. So Trump doesn't have that. But I wrote a piece about three years ago wondering, well, what if Trump did that? What if he called in, in, during his campaign next year? Um, what if he called a rally in Denver or Dallas or one of these states that kind of loves their, you know, loves them their guns and said, this is an open carry state, come to my rally and bring your guns. And then suddenly he's talking to a, a an arena full of armed people. That, that's not impossible. Um, there would be out, you know, the, the Times and the Post would quack about it very loudly, but who would, who would do anything about it? It's to be told, and uh, you know, I used to live in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, yeah, Virginia is the Confederacy, but this was like the People's Republic of Alexandria. It's like a little en liberal enclave up there. We always oh, still had, you know, Robert E. Lee highway up and so forth. Um, and there was a rally in a park about 
a mile from my house back then, this was about eight years ago, where people actually came armed with their, their you know, semi-automatic weapons and stuff, and a couple hundred people came and rallied in public in this park, and you know, it was semi-scary, some of these people are nuts, but, it, but anyway, it actually happened. This, there is an armed movement, and I started thinking, I could just see Trump creating his Second Amendment movie, uh, ha you know, hats, and it would be the SA, right? Second Amendment. Um, oh, wow. So, I don't know, this stuff is, is pretty scary stuff, I think. Um, and uh, I've done a lot of reporting in my lifetime about the NRA, I've been to their conventions. I, and by the way, the NRA is certainly not the whole populist movement, nor do they, it's a Venn diagram, but they certainly overlap um, with the Christian right, with many other people who've been around a long time. This is not something that just emerged with, with the real estate billionaire who got into the White House. Um, it's been around a long time. Um, and, you know, I've interviewed their people, the NRA, I know what they're about. Tanya Mataxa, do you remember her? She used to be their, their boss lady and chief lobbyist, and she used to say, my name is Mataxa, M-E-T-A-K-S-A, A-K as in A-K-47, S-A as in semi-automatic. That's the way she literally spelled her name, to be provocative. Um, so this is scary stuff. Um, and I mean, I have a lot of comments to make about the populist movement all around the world and how it's kind of growing and burgeoning and everything. Um, but this is, you know, stuff to take pretty seriously. Um, and I know you wouldn't be here if you didn't take it seriously. But um, so we have lots to talk about, and I hope we get some uh, provocative questions. So thanks. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Maggie? Hi. Um, this is my first CWA, and I'm very excited. So thank you for having me. Um, unlike Jennifer, I have not written a book. Unlike Bob, I have not tried to off Sean Hannity. So why am I here? I've been <laughs> actually asking myself this for a little while. Um, and I, I work on a part of the world that uh, is quite literally blowing up in ways that are good and in ways that are very bad, um, and is very much part of this global trend. And so um, I think what I'd like to focus on in my few minutes is to talk a little bit about radicalism, which um, is something I've been dealing with for the entire time I've been working on the Middle East, which is several decades. Um, and want to just note that what Jennifer talks about in terms of this nostalgia for the past is very much part of radical movements in the Middle East. You saw it with ISIS, you saw it with, um, with the sort of extremist Wahhabism um, that is popular in some parts of the Middle East. So these ideas that there is a past that was somehow idyllic and wonderful is really, I think, a common thread across all of these movements. And it is very disturbing. And I think I won't focus on what's disturbing. We know that. I think many of us in this room, we might have different political orientations, but I don't think that there are people here who want people to be radicalized in any direction, that there should be a productive way forward. And, and to me, what does that look like? I, I resist titles like preventing violent extremism, encountering violent extremism. Why are we preventing and countering? What are we offering? What's the vision? What is the vision for a young person without a job in France, in Algeria, in South Africa, in China? What is our vision for this? What is our vision of this next industrial re revolution that's coming that is displacing coal miners all over the world? We don't have a vision and we're always, I feel like, whack-a-mole. Something pops up, we're hitting it. Pops up, we're hitting it. And we spend so much energy doing this that there isn't perhaps time to offer a counter narrative. And I can't say that I've got a really compelling one. I can say that I have a key element. And it's to talk and include young people. And I must compliment CWA for the fact that you actually build a conference that integrates young people from the start. Because without doing more of this, without them being a full partner at the table, 
then what you'll see is them being a partner at home to just the sort of trends that Jennifer's identified, where 20-year-olds are coming home radicalized, and they're potentially radicalizing families. We need to do more of what you do here, which is really offer an authentic voice for young people to be heard. What is the key strategy for the Marine Corps or any radical movement in recruiting young people? And by the way, I'm not comparing the Marine Corps to radical movements. The idea is the same. You want to take a 17 or 18 year old and give them a purpose. Make them feel important because it may be the one time that they do. Whether that importance is bringing home a salary, being part of a bigger movement, being part of a campaign to do good, whether real or perceived. And the more that we can build programs that are youth-led, youth-inspired, and we actually listen to them, all of us with graying hair, it's actually more gray than blonde, <laughs> then that is real. It is not a panacea. It is better than countering and preventing. Stop whack-a-mole. Let's actually figure out, using Jennifer's research and Bob's gift of going on TV, which is incredible, and writing, by the <laughs> way. His writing is amazing if you haven't read it. And also, bring young people along on this journey. And some will be radicalized. You're not going to save everyone. What you're going to do is offer compelling vision and way forward for those that want to be engaged and want to do good. More Peace Corps. Think about all of the programs that are being cut now that actually engage young people in positive, productive ways. Get them out in the world. Build an international core where young people meet each other. Sure, there's always a risk that someone radicalizes someone else. There's also a greater risk that they are going to spend the next 20 years figuring out ways to work together. I know because the organization I work for has built much smaller programs, and I have seen exactly that happen. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and because we are officially a panel uh, of three, I may play a slightly larger role in, in our discussion, so I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more uh, before, we, before we move into a, a question here. Um, I mentioned that I uh, study, that I'm a professor in music history and in international affairs. I also consider myself uh, a scholar of the, of the radical right or radical nationalism. I'm writing a book uh, right now uh, based on a year's worth of interviews with Steve Bannon, um, Alexander Dugan, and Olavo de Cavallo. Uh, on, on those movements, so to give you a little background of, as, as to why I also am interested in this. One thing that compels me a lot is also the, the, uh, the names and the, the titles that we attach to this. Our, our panel is called Populism and the Alt-Right. Um, those could be different things. We've heard a lot of different labels come through just in these opening, uh, just in these opening remarks. Uh, Professor Fitzgerald mentioned anti-modernism, a quest for status, radical right, a quest for self-worth. Um, uh, Maggie also spoke a lot about uh, radicalism and nostalgia. Uh, but it was Bob where we heard neo-Nazi, 1930s, fascist SA. The first question that I have to the panelists is, are all of those things equivalent? To be part of the radical right, to be an anti-modernist, uh, is that the same thing as being fascist, neo-Nazi, is Trump a neo-Nazi? Is Trump a fascist? And I could open that up to the whole panel. I'll take a, I'll take a whack at a part of that. Um, so so I think that if I think about the parties that I have been studying and the supporters, um, I, I, it, it is, I think, important to distinguish between sort of right-wing populist supporters and um, white nationalists or um, fascists, and, and there, it's not that there isn't a Venn diagram that contains um, sort of members of both of those groups or all three of those groups. It, the, the main difference as I see it is that the ra radical right populist parties are for the most part okay with the basic tenets of democracy. They're not going for overall regime change so much as they are targeting very specific dimensions of liberal democracy, um, like multiculturalism, like diversity, like some of the economic liberalism that we see. And so I think there are variations of, of extremism and there are different deviations here. Sometimes we lump them all together because they do tend to sound alike. 
Um, but I think if we look at their supporters, it's important to recognize that, you know, if you think about the second round of the French presidential election in 2017, over a third of the French voters voted for Marine Le Pen. And I, I have trouble believing that, that that large of a segment of such a deeply democratic and modern society is, is fascist in nature, for instance. But this right-wing populism gives us a, a category that, that still has some of those elements and some of those more frightening dimensions, as Bob was suggesting, but doesn't paint everybody with too broad a brush. So that's my overall sense that there are variations here. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and, and this, these are complicated subjects, and all these European parties, they all have their particular characteristics and so on. Um, we were talking earlier among ourselves about this new film that just came out called The Brink. Um, it's a movie about Steve Bannon and a young woman named Alison Clayman spent a year following him around like a fly on the wall and did a whole documentary about him and how he's bopping all over Europe meeting with fascists and right-wing parties and so on and so on from Sweden and Belgium and Italy and, and Poland and France, of course, and the Brexit people. Um, meanwhile, hobnobbing with people like Eric Prince, uh, who I'm sure you all are familiar with, the, the brother of our brilliant education secretary, and, and um, uh, a guy named John Thornton from Goldman Sachs, et cetera. Um, the Goldman thing is something I wanted to bring up because I think, in a way, if there was a turning point and something that triggered a lot of this discontent that has fed into these far-right movements was the failure of capitalism in 2008. Mm. And the economic collapse that happened then had enormous repercussions all around the world. And, and I would argue that Trump presented to a large section of the American population a, a credible response to that. Um, credible in that they bought into it and somehow they convinced themselves that a billionaire who lives on Fifth Avenue was gonna lead a, a revolt from below against the elites. Because that to me is the, the defining characteristic of these far right movements is the battering of, of the elites. Um, and then we have to ask ourselves why did Hillary Clinton do so poorly, and I, okay, I know she won the popular vote, but she lost to a billionaire on Fifth Avenue, right, when she should have won 60% of the vote at least, um, to a, you know, vile, pussy-grabbing, greedy crook who, who ran for president. Um, well, because she was seen by much of the population as that elite, and in fact, she was. She voted and supported, she and her husband, for the deregulation of the banks that led directly to the crash of 2008, the, the uh, elimination of the Wall Street regulations. She voted for the war in Iraq in 2003, um, which was not a mistake, it was a criminal misadventure and an illegal war. She was seen as part of the establishment and it allowed this real estate billionaire to, to paint her into that corner. So there's another side to populism, right? Which is the left-wing version of it, the Bernie Sanders version. And Sanders rallied, among other people, the young people of this country who flocked to him en masse and are doing so again, it seems like, um, uh, and saying, I'm also running against the elite, but I'm, I'm elite, but I'm running against the Wall Street billionaires, the bankers, the millionaires and billionaires who run this country. Um, and I, I have no idea whether he would have beaten Trump. I, that's, I'm a total agnostic on that. But there's another side to how we respond. And as uh, uh, it was pointed out by my colleagues here, we need to offer a vision, right, of what's on the other side of this thing. And I, I would say it can't be the establishment vision once again. It has to be responding to the challenge that has emerged around the world from the failure of capitalism 10 years ago and the aftershocks of that that are still being felt in terms of inequality and stratification and, and so on in, in this country and in all the other countries all over the world. That's it. Um, I would just um, 
note a couple of things, and these may not be tied together very neatly. Uh, one, I don't know if anyone here has any of the data on the percentage of Trump voters that actually voted for Obama, either once or twice. But this is a fact. There are lots of Trump voters, can't say more than lots, I don't have any numbers, uh, but it's been documented in a number of articles that voted for Obama. But I'd like to pull back from the US. We end up getting very US-centric. And there is a global network of right-wing groups. This, I think, the Bannon documentary is going to showcase that really nicely. Um, and I think what we need to be most concerned about is the weaponizing of social media, something we haven't talked about yet. But you know, the SA exists online. If you see what happens to people who express different views than any and are well known publicly, and you look at the bots and trolls and other attacks by um, vocal alt-right populist uh, types, I'm now speaking of populism on the right, it's quite incredible. It's ferocious. It is. The language used, and I've seen this in Arabic, I've seen it in English, I'm sure it exists in French, is disgusting. You would recoil reading it, and it comes in wave after wave after wave. It's happening. This war is on, and if you're not seeing it on social media, then you are missing what is happening, and it is quite incredible. And the social media companies have been, as you've been seeing in the news, very slow to react, very slow to respond, and very tentative and they're getting swept away. And it is dangerous. It further radicalizes young people, and the algorithms, as we all know now, are only leading us more down the path that we've already started down. And so something we haven't touched on yet, and perhaps the audience will have questions about it, um, and I think uh, the two of you are probably gonna have more research uh, behind what's happening there. But I know that this is a trend, and it is global, and it is coordinated. And I'm not casting some terrible shadow that doesn't exist. It really does. And more people need to be aware of it. And again, not just aware, engaged, and lobbying at a minimum social media companies to do something to stop it. It will find a new form. It will not go away. But this vigilance, what is that quote about um, the eternal price of liberty is vigilance. And that's what we need in democratic societies. No one can be asleep anymore. OK, that was terrible. <laughs> I thought I was going to be not. the happy, happy, joy, joy person, but I guess not. Certainly not. A, a quick note, and I'm not quite sure what to do about this. The app has crashed. So three cheers for the analog world. Um, we do have, we do, uh, we still Maggie have people. Maggie was just saying like, to get rid of the social media. <laughs> yes, we were just talking about this. It was as if Maggie spoke it in yeah, some way. <laughs> okay, we went, we went a, a, a number of different ways with that, with that, that question. I do, do want to remind and encourage the audience to continue thinking about, about the labels that we attach to these movements. We all know, for example, who Richard Spencer is. Anyone mm -hmm. know who Richard Spencer is? He, he surfaced as a sort of public figure uh, during the 2016 presidential election, self-identified white nationalist would like to see the United States break up along ethnic lines to create new ethno-states. Uh, where whites famously got punched. Famously got punched. Punch? Mm. No, it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> so to, to personalize the question that I started with, should one speak about Richard Spencer in the same terms that one speaks about Trump? Uh, can I ask how many of you would feel comfortable describing Donald Trump as a fascist? Okay. How about a white nationalist? Neo-Nazi? A handful. Populist. Conservative. Okay, this interesting. Is fun. <laughs> this is this is fun. Orangutan. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I want to this. I know exactly. This is the sort of thing that Je Jennifer would could could map all this out for us. Um, so I would like to just in parting and in transi transitioning to another question suggest uh, pondering something. Uh, 
I gave you a, pr a preview when I s first started talking that one of the distinguishing features of this movement is I do not think that we understand what's going on with it right now. I don't know, think that we know all the motivations, all the permutations, all the nuances, all the subcategories, the groupings. Um, and I at times feel like there is a distinct danger in calling these actors fascists, neo-Nazis, and so on. It allows us to associate them with something that we have already identified, something that we know about history, the clarifying prism of history has presented to us over and over again in textbooks, and it might make us intellectually lazy. It might excuse us from doing the type of work that we need to do uh, to encounter and understand what is particular and unique about this moment. Our language can affect that at times. Um, my, my suggestion, <laughs> thank you, mom. No, that's something I stole from someone else. Um, you, you wouldn't want to know who I stole that line from. Um, so we are getting lots and lots of questions. I will, there's, we have absolutely no hope of getting to all of them here. Um, but one I would like to, uh, we have a little cluster of questions asking us about education. Um, and the role that education can play in counteracting, uh, and all the, all the cards that came here, in counteracting the growth of populism, right-wing radicalism, whatever we would like to call it. Um, turn that to our panel. The role of education? Yes. Hmm. Well, you're the educator. What okay, I'll, oh, I'll, you, no, you, you want ahead. me to like dive yeah. into this one? Okay, I'll, I'll tackle it. Um, so again, back to my earlier premise when I, uh, when I spoke, I think the, um, the power of young people, and that obviously means you engage them in the education process, it starts early. And it starts by building an education system. We all know that our education system is maybe lagging behind the 21st century, not quite there. Um, I don't like to see it just as producing kids that can do jobs, it's producing kids who can think. Critical thinking. Why don't we produce a generation of those? Who knows if AI is gonna take over the world and we're all gonna be sitting picking daisies. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could have wonderful conversations and if we could advance thought and do fantastic things that we were given this thing up there to do? So that starts by really basically reinventing our education system, and in particular, our public education system, which I'm passionate about and a product of, so you can blame that. Um, but I think that we really do need to think about it, and it starts early. It doesn't start, again, encountering. It starts in setting up ideas, and we're going to battle on every school board across the country, <coughs> alternate views, because I totally agree with the idea that we don't call people neo-Nazis. We don't label them with labels of the past. One, for those that actually are, it makes them feel really good. Two, we are in this time we are in, and the forces may look like forces that have existed for thousands of years, that the other is somehow bad or negative or there to get you. Um, that is an idea as old as time, but it's modern vestiges and what we do about it is, is now, it's here and now. And there are people that are just afraid. How about making people feel less afraid and how about starting with kids in kindergarten? Help them be less afraid by showing them that there is a world around them that they are going to be part of, like it or not. They are part of that, and on school boards, we're going to need to engage parents who we disagree with, and we're gonna to need to maybe start building that dialogue and that space for disagreement there, because this fight actually starts there. And it's being brought by a number of groups across the country and being fought by other groups. But I also think that we, as the adults in the room, need to, if we're going to exemplify behaviors that we want to see our kids take on, then we need to find out how to have respectful conversation across these differences. And ideally, pushing it down into K-12. I was, um, can I go? Yep. The, um, in the fall, I was invited to a conference in Sweden um, that brought together educators from the Nordic countries on the, this very theme of this question, which was, um, how can educators, how can teachers, how can educational systems be responsive to 
radicalization, and in particular, um, far-right radicalization. The Sweden Democrats, Ben knows more than I do about the party, um, but the Sweden Democrats have, have really grown quite quickly as a far-right party in Sweden, and, and we, for many years, thought Sweden was immune to some of these strains in society, and so they're really, they had a very self-reflective three-day conference, um, and, and it was fascinating. They had people there who were involved with working with radicalized youth, um, far-right youth, uh, skinhead youth, et cetera. Um, and one of the big messages came from, that came from this conference, and this was more their conclusions um, than anything that I brought up, really was about listening and giving voice and not shutting down young people when they experiment with certain kinds of ideas that, that may seem gruesome, that may seem terrifying, but instead trying to dialogue with them. So again, this is a very Nordic kind of reaction and a very understanding one. It was a very sort of sensitive conference um, without a lot of judgment when it came to young people and, and how they were becoming um, more extreme in certain environments. Um, and then the other thing that um, some research that I did that I presented there that might be relevant to this conversation is that um, one of the things we found for looking at young people who vote Sweden Democrats in Sweden tends to be that they feel alienated from political establishment. They, they think leaders don't listen to people like them. That's a really common thread um, that we find in survey analysis. But also oftentimes they, they feel their parents don't listen to them at home. Um, so this isn't, and these aren't questions where you say, why do you vote Sweden Democrat? It doesn't work that way because people oftentimes don't even realize why. Um, and so you just ask a bunch of survey questions and you look to see which ones work together. Where are we seeing patterns? And it tends to be the case that the young people who say that at home they're not a part of family decisions, their fa parents don't let them finish their thoughts, they're not invited when there's a choice to be made to participate in that choice. It's called household democracy. Um, where that is, is scarce for young people, they tend to be more attracted to these movements. So I think it's just a comment here um, to Maggie's point on, on radicalization and, and how a certain way of approaching young people um, may be a solution going forward. Should we go on? We'll go on. Um, related to that, we have a couple, a couple of questions coming to us, presumably from parents about their children. <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, one of them uh, reports having a son uh, who has become quite excited about the alt-right cyberspace uh, imprint um, and asks about what steps could be taken to deprogram the son, uh, the son in quotes. Uh, another question, and this was directed uh, at, at you, Jennifer, uh, was wanting to confirm that indeed young people are pushing their parents to the right. And a follow-up question of that is, is what we're seeing among the youth today just an example of a generational turnover, uh, of an oscillation of generational thought, uh, something akin to what we would have seen in the 1960s? Anyone care to jump in? Yeah, I, I, I don't know about this question about the youth, but to me, they're the future, and they're pretty good. Um, I, don't, I don't see any trend among younger people um, to, toward becoming alt-right fanatics um, or far-right movement people. Of course there's, an, there's, there's some of them. Um, but I think that, that young people are showing a remarkable, not only resilience, but willingness to get engaged and active and participate in many, many ways in, in politics. And so I'm, uh, I'm encouraged, I mean, I think the future of this country and, and around the world is the fact that young people are far less racist, far less sexist, far less fearful of immigration and the other, um, much more willing to think more broadly and inclusively about who they are, what place in the world. And I think it's the, I think it's the old people, especially the old white men who, who are you know, time to go away, and and so I'm. I don't. Dis I agree. Uh, disagree a hundred percent or a thousand percent with this notion that somehow young people are bringing the country to the right. I think it's the exact, precise opposite. That's my own experience, and I think polls uh, show that. By the way, um, on the other hand, I would say that it's true that the elites are not representing us well. They have not for the last two generations or more represented us well. 
this country is really messed up, and that's true all around the world. This is a phenomenon that goes way beyond Europe. In Japan, you have a far-right prime minister and party that's a, a, a right nationalist party that wants to reassert Japan's place in the world. In India, you have a Hindu, na Hindu nationalist movement that's quite fanatical and has been involved in genocidal attacks against Muslims. In Turkey, you have a prime minister who is a, a Muslim fundamentalist authoritarian leader who wants to restore Turkish greatness into Central Asia and, and possibly take over parts of Iraq and Syria. Um, in, I mean, you could go down the list of people that are, are like following this pattern all around the world. Um, and again, I would argue that this is not something, you can't explain a worldwide phenomenon by, um, you know, localistically defined terms. This is something that's happening globally, but I think there's a pretty solid global movement against it as well. So I'm not, I'm not completely pessimistic about all this stuff. I think there's a fight back that's happening. I think the young people are in the forefront of it. I think in the United States, women and minority voters are the coalition that elected Obama. And by the way, the percentage, someone asked about the percentage who voted from, this is a really super complicated question. The people who voted for Obama did not mostly vote for Trump, according to the data. They stayed home in 2016. And the people who voted for Trump are the people who stayed home, mostly white people, who came out in places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and voted for Trump, who did not vote in 2016, possibly because they didn't like voting for an African American. So there was, of course, there were some counties, many, I think, a couple of hundred counties that voted for Obama in 2016 and then for Trump, I mean, 12, and then for Trump in 2016. Those counties flipped, hundreds of them, but the individuals within those counties were a whole different set of population, right? So I'm going to close on this. There was a poll done of non-registered voters in 2012. Um, you should look it up. There's many other such polls. You know, when they call up and they do a poll, they say, are you registered to vote? If you say no, they hang up. So if you, this guy said, okay, if you're registered, I don't want to talk to you. They did a poll of the people who are not registered to vote, and they were for Obama over Romney by a factor of something like 70 to 25. Okay, so it was an overwhelming majority of the non-registered voters. Who are they? Young people, mm -hmm. minorities, people who don't, poor, uh, you know, people who can't take off Tuesday to vote. Why don't we vote on Sunday or Saturday? I don't know. So, so there's a lot of hope in this country if we can mobilize that population. And that's, you know, that's all our job is to, to mobilize it. That's all. Um, so, so on the what young people are doing to their parents, um, in fact, it's a balanced story. Um, so in, this is a study that um, I did in Switzerland, and there are roughly five parties that compete effectively in elections in Switzerland. There's the Greens that are kind of far to the left. There's the Swiss People's Party, which is quite far to the right. And then there are three sort of middle of the road kind of parties. And what we found in our study is that parents are successfully influencing their children to vote for one of these three main parties in the center. Young people are the ones that bring in the new ideas, whether they're left or right, encouraging their parents successfully in, in many cases to vote for the Greens or encouraging them to vote for the radical, the radical right, the SVP. So it's actually a balanced story. It's more about the decline of mainstream parties and the rise of new parties rather than specifically a story about the right. A quick anecdotal comment. Uh, I teach a course about once a year here on campus called Radical Nationalism, where we study all of this stuff, and we do it primarily studying um, uh, primary sources. Uh, that is to say, we don't we study the works produced by uh, by radical nationalists without a lot of editorializing um, for students. Uh, it's come up in a, in a couple of instances. I've heard students say to me, and I think this is true. I wonder what you think. Uh, that is very difficult for young people to shock their parents by way of leftism today. Uh, that there are fewer and fewer families who, and, and households uh, where, where students could upset, offend their parents through some, some left-wing position. Uh, the opposite is certainly not true when it comes to the right. Uh, and 
I've never spent a lot of time as a scholar on it, but the ability to shock, the ability also to control and impact your world by way of shock, shock value. Uh, that seems quite important to me, to the youth experience. It was to my experience, I'm un unfortunately to my parents. Um, but there's something, there's something going on there. Uh, yes, Bob's comments are, are true. I don't think that we, we want to overlook that one of the main uh, counter reactions to populism is coming from a new, diverse, mobilized youth. Um, but at, at, the, at the same, at, at the, in the same instance, some of the cultural vibrancy, some of the cultural force that we see online with the alt-right in particular, which in my estimation is not an ideological movement, it's a methodological movement. The alt-right comes into existence thanks to the internet. It does not have many new ideas within, if you view it from, from within the extreme right. Uh, the power of that, it comes, it comes from shock. Um, it, it is the dissident force right now in the world and, and um, might be worth thinking about a bit in those terms. Um, men, boys, that came up uh, a number of times uh, in, in what people, what my fellow panelists have been saying. I've also s received a couple questions about the role of gender in the alt-right. Of course, we have figures like David Duke, um, uh, the Charleston shooter, Richard Spencer, uh, young white men, men who used to be young white men, uh, being attracted to this movement. Part of that is easy to understand. If, if these forces are yearning for a bygone past, uh, it might in fact be more, more intuitive to, to yearn for a past if it supported you, if your gender and your race gave you access to, uh, to, uh, to power. Um, so it's not surprising uh, that we would see that, but I wonder if we can add to that, if we can nuance the role of, of gender in this. We have not only these extreme figures, but we also have Jordan Peterson. Anyone know who Jordan Peterson is? It's become a sort of online uh, phenomena, YouTube uh, uh, profile. He's a professor at University of Toronto. He's written a book uh, on how young men implicitly, although he always denies that it's directed to young men, but how young men can straighten their lives up and he's also hostile to feminism and, and is overlapping a lot with the alt-right. Anyways, uh, panelists, do we, can we talk about the role of gender? What role do, uh, do women play in, in dealing with this populist movement? What role do men play in this populist movement? You were nodding, oh, I was <laughs> Professor Fitzgerald. So I was behind after, after the election, I wanted to go in 2016. I felt like every time I saw a white man, especially around my age, I wanted to just go up and punch them in the nose on general principles that, <laughs> that they were likely the reason we had this, this thing. So, um, uh, you know, I don't see any of this stuff as new. I mean, I've written a lot about the Christian right in this country. Um, it emerged as a politicized movement um, back in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, when Jerry Falwell and company created The Moral Majority. I've written a lot about that and about the Left Behind books um, that um, Tim LaHaye wrote. I'm sure you've all seen them when that was a, a cult phenomenon. I think they sold like 100 million books about the rapture. Um, somebody said, they had bumper stickers that like, during the rapture, this car will not have a driver, and someone else made bumper stickers that said, in case of the rapture, can I have your car? <laughs> Um, but, but the Christian coalition was, was largely reaction to the women's movement, right? To, to women's equality movement, to, to the Roe v. Wade decision, um, and to the, the sexual identity and sexual freedom movement. And those two things combined to get a lot of men really mad about a lot of things. And that, you know, grew and developed in the 80s and 90s, and then I think has you know, kind of morphed into this alt-right phenomenon. Um, Steve Baden has written a lot about, do you remember Gamergate and all that stuff about the, the online men who do these games? And I mean, this is a male thing for sure. And yes, there are many women who go along in, with it and so forth, but um, um, this is boys being bad boys. So one thing that in political science we have had sort of this puzzle about the radical right in particular, but some of these more extremist movements. Um, the puzzle has long been, why don't women participate at greater rates? 
And I always thought that was a weird question. I thought, why on earth would any woman support these movements? And so one of the things that, that I've discovered, and some of this is from my work in France, um, is that m nationalism tends to be oftentimes associated very deeply with masculinity and a sort of violent masculinity that t turns women off. Um, and in fact, what, what we found is that women approach these radical movements not from a position of nationalism, but from a position of localism, um, uh, an affection for their communities, a feeling that they want to protect their local areas, and in fact, sort of, they take that as a pathway to these movements and finding them more appealing, as opposed to that more sort of vigorous um, masculine nationalism, which just isn't particularly accessible for a lot of women. And so there's there's a just so many different motivations, and there's so many different ways that that people will sort of position themselves to approach politics. And I think if we just sort of look from a top-down perspective, we miss a lot of the variation there with respect to, you know, as a member of this community, a woman might say, I'm going to support this party, as opposed to as a member of this national community, for instance. And we, we gloss over that a lot of times, and I think that's a problem. I don't know, I've been thinking about the ISIS brides, right? The mothers and children that are in camps across Iraq and Syria right now, and the ongoing discussion of whether to bring them back, whether to strip them of their foreign nationality if they have it. And I don't know that I know what to say about that. It, it troubles me on so many levels, and I feel pulled towards a protectionist attitude, towards you know not letting um, what could be uh, people who will not, who will help radicalize others into the country. And I also look at those kids and say, are we really writing them off? Um, I, don't, I don't know that I have an answer. I know that there are women who support these movements for those reasons and for, for other reasons. And, and it's hard for me to identify with them, but I go back to what I would tell the, the parent that wrote that question, which must have been very painful about a son or daughter being pulled to the alt-right. Talk to them. We can't do anything unless we talk to each other. Like actually talk to each other, ask questions. People who are radicalized often get information that actually isn't true. And instead of saying, well, that's not true, show them something. Have the ability to have that conversation and offer another viewpoint. And don't think you're going to win the first time out the gate. It's a process. De-radicalization is a process. Talk to the countries that have been involved in doing it, from Saudi Arabia to, um, to countries in Europe, to our own um, intelligence agencies. It's a process. But it starts with having conversations and, and having empathy. And it's very hard, I think, to have empathy when you don't see the other person as human, and, and that's what the right does such a great job of. Uh, I'm sorry, I should not say the right, the radical right, the alt-right, the idea that all of us are not equal, that based on gender or the color of our skin or our sexuality or any other orientation, that we are not equal. That is their starting point. There are some, like Animal Farm, who are more equal. By the way, I, would, I think it's okay to say the right. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the Republican Party has become a cult. There's no, there's, there is no Republican Party in this country. They've become a cult of Donald Trump. Their, their stooges in Congress are absolutely supine over insult after insult. The, the voters, the Republican voters are backing Trump by 80 to 90 percent continually over the past four years, believe it or not. They, they have not budged once, whereas independents, at least, have sharply dropped, dropped off. So it's the right, friends. It's the right that's the problem in this country. And until, until I mean, I'm all for dialogue, but, but sometimes the opposition, you know, has to be crushed in an election after election after election until they get the message. And if we don't crush them next year, and crush them the next two years and the next four years, then they're not gonna get that message. So I'm okay with saying the right are the bad guys in this country, because they are. 
Yeah. I, I would just Steve. like to note, oh, because I feel like uh, I have not authentically represented myself, that I am a muscular Sorry. liberal. So, and here's what I mean. First, you kill him with kindness. And if it doesn't work, to Bob's point, you just kill him. I think that's what we did in World War II. Um, it was about a month ago, I was down in Tucson. Steve Bannon has a brother, Chris, uh, who lives just north of the city. Uh, he's, he's on indefinite leave with pay from the University of Arizona. Um, when he, that was being announced to him, we t he told me this over dinner that the administrators sat down with him. They, they let him know what their position was. He had become too incendiary of a figure to, to keep his job. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, one of his one of his bosses uh, said, as he was leaving the room, he said, you know that half the country hates your brother, right? And Chris turned around and said, yeah, well, you know, the other half loves him. And she said, yeah, not the half that counts. Beware, please. I could have just added the qualifier and told you the same thing about myself that Maggie told you about herself. Yeah. This is not a reflection of my politics. It is entirely in your capability to do the same type of dehumanizing thing to yes. the other side as it is to, for them to do it to you. It doesn't mean that it's equal. It doesn't mean that we have to, to make an equivalent. I don't know if a marriage proposal, uh, if you've ever heard a marriage proposal that begins by saying, you're not quite as bad as a Nazi, but. <laughs> so I'm not, certainly not doing that, but please, please be, be sensitive to that possibility. We have, a, we have a cluster of, of very, very compelling uh, questions, and I'm so sorry that we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but ask, uh, ask us to think about and speak about this movement in a broader context, uh, to think about the ways in which, for example, the populist uprising could have to do, and, and Maggie, this might be a, a question f to start with you, um, has to do with political turmoil in the Middle East, with climate change, with global capitalism. Um, are we perhaps doing a disservice to the topic by isolating it, extracting it from this broader global series of currents? Um, I, I do think it's all connected. I, I think there are connections across the board. I think these are very unsettling times for a whole host of reasons. Climate is changing, economies are changing. Um, nothing is, the forces at work changing our planet and our ways of life are working faster than we are able to keep up with, and it's scary. There are things happening people don't understand. Does anyone here really say that they've got a really strong grasp on AI? I do not. I do not. I don't, I don't even understand. It probably told me to say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, it, it's, you know, if you're honest, it's, it's pretty scary. Um, I, I, I wake up and read headlines. I work on the Middle East, so every day I'm just, you know, shock and awe, you know, by 7 a.m. I just want to go back to bed. Um, and we're, we're all struggling with this. The one thing that unites us is that, is that we're all stuck on this place, and we are all struggling with it, except for Elon Musk. Apparently, he's not stuck here, so he'll, he'll go somewhere <laughs> else and, and let us know how that goes. But uh, we're all stuck here. This is the crazy thing. We are all stuck with each other. So that would be my first point. Like, we have to all agree that we're here. We can say things about sending people to Mars on a one-way trip with Elon, but really, we're here. And so what are we gonna do about it? And we have to recognize these things are happening, okay? You want, don't wanna say it's climate change, don't say it's climate change. Things are happening. We're having more floods and more fires in places that there weren't floods and fires before. Things that happened every 100 years and were called an every 100-year event happen every 10, maybe now five. I don't care what we label things. We have to figure out a way to work together to solve challenges that we identify as challenges, whatever we call them. And maybe we figure out ways to work on things that we can agree on and set the other side stuff aside. This is what used to happen in that institution called Congress. We used to try to figure out how to come together on the stuff we could agree on. Now we figure out how to get on C-SPAN and make sure that we're trending those things don't always lead to moderation and problem solving. And are we rewarding moderation? Are we, again, I put us in the actor's chair. Like, what are we, each of us, doing to reward moderation? 
to say, you know, it may not be sexy, but let's figure out a way forward. And I may have to give a little, and they're gonna have to give a little. And there are people on either extreme, I love this point, that will not give. And it may feel good, I know I feel good on the left, you know, love to hit that button and reflexively feel like, oh wow, Sanders or anyone else who's saying something that seems like really strong against the other side, that's great, and I think it is. But we have to get things done. And I think, don't we miss those days when you heard about some big bill happening that, okay, we felt good about maybe 60% of it. 60% is good. It's called compromise, it's called democracy. We don't all get our way. Trump wants his way, you see what that looks like. That's, I think, not us. I think we're all resisting that. I think even people who may like him feel at times he goes too far. You, you know, the interviews with Trump voters that I listen to is not that everyone is just over the moon. They, they have some issues, you know. Maybe he could stop the tweeting or maybe he could be a little less this or a little less that. There's hope. Uh, I think we have time for, for one more response. Anyone care to either deal with that question of this movement within a broader system or yeah. make a part? Yes, go for it, please. Um, so one of the big issues that we haven't talked about much today is immigration, and that team seems to be one of the, or migration more broadly, it seems to be one of the, the trends that people find scary or intimidating, and it oftentimes fuels um, some of these more radical movements. and. And one thing I want to point out is that it, it, it's experienced, if we just think about it as this monolithic trend, I think we miss a lot of the nuance with respect to how people experience something like migration. And so I would give you an example from France in some of the more um, industrialized urban areas. Immigration is, is, is this, it, the story you hear when it comes to how people experience it is um, as, as sort of natives, you know, people who lived there before. Um, it's a it's a familiar story that people perceive that immigrants are taking their jobs or that they're you know changing their way of life and that this is a you know a, a threat to the way they they think life should should be lived and and in these rural communities rural communities in France you know I would ask about immigration and they'd say well there's a couple Moroccan families they're they're fine and some Brits have moved down here and retired there they seem they keep to themselves no big deal but these Parisians they move in here and they want the church bells to not ring so early on Sunday and could they please you know run Wi-Fi up the church steeple and and so I think that we we do focus a lot on some of these bigger trends and it's important but at the same time the way that that is lived the lived experience of things like that oftentimes takes so many different dimensions and different characteristics that again I would just I'm more of a grassroots kind of um, researcher, but I would urge you to think not just about what those broader trends are, but how they get experienced in different communities. Thank you. The final word from Professor uh, Fitzgerald. This conversation, these topics are not going away, not during the rest of this conference and not after this conference. I thank you so much for your attentiveness, for your wonderful questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all. Uh, most of our panelists will be here. Dr. Fitzgerald has to run to a thesis defense. But please, a round of applause for these wonderful panelists. Everybody. Okay, I know you have to run. Goodbye. Goodbye. Nice to meet you. Exactly. No formalities. Leave me alone.